I think I messed up. Wait, I'm sure I did. Welcome to Young Elder TV, where UFOs, religions, Anunnaki, and black youth collide in a cosmic comedy. Meet Marcus, our fearless leader. He's an aspiring scientist and part-time alien enthusiast. Then there's Maya, his sister, a no-nonsense lawyer who secretly believes in ancient astronauts. Oh, and don't forget Grandma Pearl. She swears she had tea with an alien once. And finally, their quirky neighbor, Mr. Thompson, convinced he's a reincarnated god. With three million fans already hooked, Young Elder TV blends laughs with galactic mysteries. Ready to join the fun? Hit that subscribe button and dive into the cosmic chaos. Young Elder TV, where the stars align for comedy. Hi, friends. I am Young Elder's butler, Dr. Charles P. Winston. I work in the lab assisting the young elder. Today I'm diving into the fascinating realm of ancient bird beings from the cosmos. We explore two primary types, the carrions and the blue avians. First, the carrions, originating from Alpha Draconis in the Orion constellation. These ancient beings evolved to bipedal forms resembling a mix of birds and humans. With vibrant plumage and a variety of shapes and sizes, carrions can range from towering 12 feet to mere inches in height. Known for their sharp analytical minds, they excel as generals, strategists and bureaucrats. But their vanity and obsession with appearance are legendary. A notable subgroup is the Altari from the planet Altari. Aggressive and honourable, these carrions are at war with the feline beings. Another fascinating species is the firecans. Resembling seven-foot-tall predatory birds, their matriarchal society values the flock over the individual, creating a stable but change-resistant culture. The Firekans are deeply spiritual with rituals emphasizing flight and nature. The Skor, another carrion subgroup, hail from the planet Aurelia. These warrior monarchs have advanced technology and can breed vast armies quickly. Their leaders' thought patterns are preserved in the soul of Skor, guiding them even after death. Now let's talk about the Blue Avians. Hailing from planets in the Lyra galaxy, these divine beings are part of the Sphere Alliance. Unlike the Carrions, who are neutral and logical, the Blue Avians are spiritual and benevolent. They're here to oversee our solar system and prevent galactic war. The Carrions and Blue Avians share a complex history of genetic experimentation and interstellar politics. While the Carrions are revered for their scientific prowess, the Blue Avians focus on spiritual ascension and telepathic communication. These ancient bird beings, with their rich history and diverse cultures, continue to intrigue and inspire us. As we learn more about them, we uncover the secrets of the cosmos and our own existence. Keep looking to the stars as we move forward on this mission. Don't forget to like, comment, share, hit the bell, and subscribe to Young Elder TV for more cosmic explorations. Check back with us every day for new content. Let's get started. The Carrions, also known as Avians, originate in the star system of Alpha Draconis in the Orion constellation. The Carrions are one of the two most ancient alien races in the universe. The bird beings came with the Anunnaki. In fact, the bird beings are Anunnaki, who came down from the grand mother ship Nibiru. Their species evolved to have bipedal bodies that look like a cross between a bird and a human. Carrions have a lot more variety of shapes, sizes and colours than many other races in the universe. They possess coloured plumage in bold and vibrant colour schemes, with every carrion's completely unique in their own design. The size of these aliens can be anywhere from up to 12 feet tall to only a handful of inches in height. The carrions advanced quickly into becoming a grand interstellar civilization. They are known for their sharp analytical abilities and organisational skills. A predominant character trait of the Carrions is the obsession with maintaining a good appearance and social image at all times. They're vain, paying a lot of attention to their appearance and ornamentation. The Carrions gear their society around adherence to codes of conduct, structure and discipline. Their sharp, analytical minds make them extremely talented generals, strategists, organisers and bureaucrats. There is a type of Carrions called the Altari, from the planet Altari in the Orion star system. Altari are an honorable but aggressive species of carrion bipeds, which developed an interstellar spacefaring civilization. Oh, by the way, a biped or bipedalism is a form of terrestrial locomotion where an animal moves by means of its two rear limbs or legs. 
An animal or machine that usually moves in a bipedal manner is known as a biped, meaning two feet. Types of bipedal movement include walking or running and hopping. The Alkari bird beings are slowly evolving from carrions back to reptilian. They are at war with the feline beings. The carrions have a coat of feathers, a beak, scaly legs, talons, etc. The bird beings are very intelligent and are about 100 million years ahead of the Earth humans in technology and spiritual science. The bird beings have mastered the art of ascension. They can vibrate from the third to the eighth dimension. The bird beings go back 200 billion years in the universe. They were created by an ancient from the power of the sun crystal. It's said that the bird beings are the ancient spirits who lost their shell in the first war in Pegasus. These spirits transcended into bird-looking shells. The birds have been around alone side the ancients, Rizkians helping them fight the insects and reptilian aliens. There's many different types of bird beings, just like there's many different species of birds on your planet. Over the billions of years of evolution and race mixing, there are thousands of different types of bird beings. Though the avian exists as one species, many different breeds exist throughout their lineage. Each breed exhibits unique traits, often similar to other bird species found throughout Earth, such as hawks, owls, eagles, phoenix and many other birds, though they all share the same general body structure. Many different breeds and varieties exist, possibly due to centuries of adaptation to different stars and environments on planets. There's some bird beings who chose to lower their vibration by listening to the disagreeable reptilians. An avian bird being, also known as featheries, are anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphism is the act of giving non-human animals human characteristics, such as the ability to walk upright, talk, or experience human emotions. The term comes from the Greek words anthrop, meaning human being, and morphos, meaning to have a specific certain shape. And examples of anthropomorphism are Disney characters like Mickey and Minnie Mouse or the candlestick teapot and clock in Beauty and the Beast, the animals in George Orwell's novella Animal Farm, and brand mascots like Cheeto's Chester Cheetah. They use their whole brain and they are very telepathic. They also use an advanced form of sign language. The bird beings also were part of the group referred to as the Anunnaki. Many different types of Anunnaki who traveled from a distant 12th planet called Nibiru, the Grand Mothership, when the ancient Rizkians started coming to Earth. One of the races that came with them were the bird beings. The bird beings are great teachers. The next race of bird beings are the firecans, are an avian species that resemble seven foot tall predatory birds. Firecan males are slightly smaller than their female counterparts. Firecan culture relies heavily on a matriarchal flock system Firecan society values the interests of the flock, which consists of a matriarch and her family, above those of the individual. This creates a stable society, but one that can have difficulty adapting to new things unless it is forced to. Each flock grooms a specific child from birth to become flock leader. A flock leader leads her flock in many aspects of life. According to the tenet of the living spark, the acts of a flock leader shape the flock and the future. The overall leader of Firecan culture, the flock leader of flock leaders, is known as the Tihin Ri. Because of the strong subordination to a flock and the flock's desire to remain close, few Firecans, at least in the past, have left their flocks to go out into space. Firecan religion and philosophy are very spiritual and are based heavily on imagery of flight and nature. Midnight ceremonies are held at the Firakan fire temples. Firekans commonly follow the flame winds doctrine, which emphasizes living in the moment and not worrying about the future or planning ahead. Any occurrence can undo any plan, so it is futile to plan ahead. The firekans also participate in a number of flying dances used for a number of purposes, from bonding to mourning. Firekans are very social creatures and as such have a complex system of greetings, gestures and customs. The first thing an outsider will notice is the Firakan greeting. To be sure that their acquaintance will be free of pests during while in their company, Firakans greet each other by searching the feathers, hair or fur of their acquaintance for parasites and bugs. Also, an outsider should note that Firakans display their amusement by leaning backwards and clattering their beaks in a gesture similar to human laughter. 
Other notable things include the ducking of one's head between the shoulders when embarrassed and the involuntary molting when frightened. Pirican architecture is distinct in that it is created for a race with flight. Buildings are arranged without stairs or fences at large drops, which can be quite disconcerting to visitors. Bars and pubs have perches for their patrons instead of chains. Firakan pubs are quite probably most famous for their potent alcoholic drink known as Firakas Finest. Along with socialising over a Firakas Finest, Firakans have a number of recreational activities, including flight races. The Confederation of Planets made contact with the Firakans in 1953 and pledged to protect them while Firakan entry into the Confederation was negotiated. Shortly after this contact with the Confederation, the first Firakans left their flocks and planet to travel between star systems. The Firakan Planetary Alliance had been created and the Firakans had claimed the nearby star system of Takirsa. The next race of bird beings are the Score. The Score are bipedal carrion with lifespans spanning hundreds of years. They are feathered and stand from two to three meters tall. Their body is much like that of a winged humanoid with bird legs and head. They come from a planet called Aurelia, the second planet orbiting the star She Hercules, 160 light years from Earth in the Milky Way galaxy. They have developed a spacefaring civilization and have long existed as a warrior monarchic culture with advanced technology and the ability to breed vast armies very quickly when one of their lead his race into a new era of peace. After the leader's death, his thought patterns were preserved in an indurate sculpture referred to as the Soul of Score. The Score's technology advanced quickly, allowing them to be uncontested rulers of their little pocket of the universe. Eventually, they began genetic experimentation. They mixed their own DNA back with reptiles. They had help from an Anunnaki named Mother Huber. She is Anu's sister. This experiment would lead to one of the first genetically altered new races in the cosmos to come into being, the Draconian Reptilians. The Carrions wanted this child species to be powerful, self-perpetuating and dominating. They taught the Draconians Reptilians that everything in the universe was theirs for the taking and that it was their birthright to rule. However, the Carrions seeded countless worlds that would evolve into various life forms and engineered many other sentient species of diverse natures other than the reptilians and their many subspecies. They created many subspecies of their own race as well such as the blue avians who ascended past them in spiritual science. The next bird race on the list are the ascended bird race called the blue avians which for the most part are agreeable. Their leaders are referred to as the Rater'er the leader's names are Mephos on the left. The second in charge is Kephos on the right. They come from the planets Avian, Abina, Kethsi and Brontitol in the Lyra galaxy, which is 25 light years away. They have bases in other galaxies as well. On the planet Brontitol, the entire surface of the planet is covered with a dry, crumbly substance that is not stone, rock or some other form of dry, crumbly rock or stone that the reader is heretofore unacquainted with, but long since decayed and disintegrated shoes. The planet Abina has a shattered core and floating islands surrounding it. The Blue Avian are part of the Sphere Alliance that is overseeing your solar system to prevent a war in your galaxy. Tahuti is ambassador for the bird beings in this galaxy. The avian humanoid giant bird when standing is much larger than an average human. They get about 10 feet tall with their wings reaching as much as 15 feet. Some of the ascended bird beings don't have wings. Their wings are in the mind. The bird beings for the most part are divine and very spiritual beings. They are similar to the carrions in demeanor and attributes but are more benevolent in nature whereas the Carrions are neutral. The Blue Avians have nothing to do with galactic politics focused on domination or control. Carrions, on the other hand, believe in order at any cost, with the ends justifying the means. Carrions were allegedly the first bird sentient species born into the universe and believe it is their birthright and their destiny to rule all existence, even if indirectly. However, this doesn't mean they're conquering dominators. In fact, they're very logical and analytical with little cause to do things except for objectively beneficial outcomes. 
They're more chess players than warriors, which makes an interesting question on why the Carrions would be involved with Mother Hubur creating the reptilians to be a race of beings who basically hold conquest and dominance as a religion. Carrions are not malevolent or evil, but reptilians could definitely fill those categories. Maybe through their cold-blooded logic, they assumed they could bring order to the universe through the reptilians. The reptilians would eventually outnumber their creators, and the Carrions would take a back seat in their mutual civilizations. However, the Carrions are extremely revered by the reptilians and often lead them as well as being the main scientific minds behind the Draconians. They shared all their knowledge and technology with their children and also assist in genetic manipulation to create subraces of reptilians from conquered species. They are even at the forefront of reptilian invasions throughout their endless galactic wars, though much less in number by an extreme amount when compared to their reptilian creations. The Carrions still hold high places of honor in the Draconian Empire, the Reptilian Empire, which is one of the most powerful factions in the universe. And these bird-like aliens explored, colonized, and charted the cosmos with faster-than-light travel long before any other race in existence. The next bird race are the Shan Sheath. The Shan Sheath are species of avian bipeds. Two meters tall, they have hunched shoulders with a long neck protruding from the middle section of their body and a vulture-like head. They have five digits clawed hands and feet. A part of their head, neck, feet, and hands, most of their body is covered in feathers. They're able to project energy beams from their hands and like wearing robes and jewels. A peaceful advanced spacefaring civilization led by a political entity known as the Wide Wing of the High Shansheath Nest. They have been known amongst the interstellar community as galactic undertakers, journeying through space in tribal groups to return lost heroes to their kin. They employ shards of black stones called epitaph sotnus, which they use to project holographic images to communicate with other species, and have also been known to use devices called memory weaves to extracting memories and turning them into physical objects. The next bird race beings are known as the Lunkers. The Lunkers are bird-like creatures with slim torsos and delicate arms tipped with four-fingered, talon-like hands that evolved over tens of thousands of years from wings. Due to the frail nature of their bodies, Lunkers tended to shy away from conflict and confrontation. Their necks in particular were most vulnerable and were reflexively guarded during combat. They were, however, agile creatures with a typically avian digitigrade stance and flay-toed feet, useful for jumping. The Lunkers had a convex face ending in a beak-like mouth around which were tufts of soft whiskers, much like avian birds. The head of a Lunker capped with two twisting antennae, the use of which remains unknown, and a feather-lined ridge protruding from the skull. These feathers changed colors, depending on the Lunker's mood. Green indicated inquisitiveness, thoughtfulness or amusement. Orange was a sign of happiness. Blue meant apathy and gray was anger, disgust, irritation or seriousness. One of the most intriguing aspects of the species was the chemical makeup of their tears. Female Lunker especially had lacrimal glands that enabled them to alter their tears to produce a variety of pheromonal substances that affected males during mating. The trusted male had such control over her tears that they could, with the aid of the universal energy, be engineered to produce any number of chemical substances, ranging from poisons to healing fluids more powerful than the Anunnaki elixir. The Lunkers, as a society, were very private, preferring to remain unnoticed by the larger galaxy. They commonly spoke only on matters of great importance most times, or were content to simply listen at other times. It was believed that the Lunkers' total population was small, although this may simply have been an effect of their reclusive nature when compared with other species. The Lunkers were, however, adept at political intrigue, Culturally, they were a manipulative species, similar to the saps, but much more devious. Many Lunkers were indeed bigots, looking upon other races as inferior, sometimes even as toys for their own amusement. The Lankers would create plots within plots to achieve either highly complex or, at times, very simple goals. They spoke indirectly to others, rarely revealing their true desires, and were fond of riddles and analogies designed to confuse and confound. Because of this, 
The Lunka were a highly self-serving, self-interested species that was only generous when their actions hid an ulterior motive. The Lunka were also aware and wise enough to spot the dangers inherent in other species and were vigilant in self-preservation during their dealings with other races. Due to their secretive, private nature, Lunkas were hardly seen throughout the galaxy at any point in time. It is possible that the species was one of those targeted for extinction by draconian reptilians. Even as late as a decade prior to the Galactic Wars, the species was considered to be largely extinct. The next bird beings are Kali Boba, an avian sentient species known during the times of the New Republic. The species had manes and prehensile wingtips. They also had a reputation of being better with words than with acts, something that not even the Kali Boba themselves argued. A number of Kali Boba were seen in the galaxy. A Kali Boba was a tall avian sentient. At least one Kali Boba had pale blue eyes. A Kali Boba also had a mane of feathers that the individual could shake, sometimes indicating an easygoing criticism. A Kali Boba had a big beak that could be used to whinny in the species equivalent to a sigh, or to expel sounds created in the depths of the Kali Boba's throat. A Caliboba had a robust voice generated in the beak. Caliboba had big wings that did not allow them to fly, but an individual could flutter them to increase his walking speed. The wings could be folded either in front or behind the person and were strong enough to be used in melee combat. The tips of the wings were prehensile like fingers. Caliboba used these as fingers to press keys or to flicker restlessly. Caliboba also had tails that they could flicker in what was considered the Caliboba version of a shrug. The Caliboba had a reputation for being particularly rhetorical. Two, even if it detracted their skill for other activities seen as more active. The Caliboba themselves were familiar with their stigma, but many of them believed that words were useful at certain times, even if only actions could be useful at other times. The Caliboba were among the many sentient species in the galactic community as of now. A human from the Galactic Federation of Life could shake hands with a Caliboba. The next bird race of being are the Sapsuckers. The Sapsucker were a sentient carnivorous avian species native to the planet Sapsucker. With a generally humanoid body structure, the species possessed hand-tipped wings which allowed them to both fly and manipulate tools although the sapsuckers were incredibly primitive in terms of technological advancement. Friendly and accepting of others, the avians lived in small groups known as nests, which existed in harmony with each other and non-sapsuckers' neighbours they encountered, including members of the Kig religion who settled on their homeworld. Sapsuckers were extremely capable when it came to learning new languages, as they could perfectly mimic anything said to them. This mimicry did sometimes cause misunderstandings when off-worlders first encountered sapsuckers, as it appeared as though the avians were mocking the new arrivals. The sapsuckers are a sentient avian species of carnivores, which possessed a brown and white-feathered humanoid form, with two legs ending in four-toed feet, two arms, a tail, and a head. The species' two arms consisted of feathered wings ending in nimble, three-fingered humanoid hands capable of manipulating tools. The wings allowed the sapsucker to fly at great speeds, which was their method of travel equivalent to running in land-based species. A sapsucker's head contained a beak between two yellow eyes framed by a large brow. Sapsuckers were capable of mimicking anything said to them perfectly and also possessed extremely strong senses, particularly hearing and sight. Sapsuckers, on average, stood 1.6 metres tall and had yellow skin. Native to the planet Sap, the sapsuckers lived in loose, primitive tribes, two known as nests. One clustered high upon the planet's mountains, away from the hot and humid lowland swamps. Each nest consisted of a small number of family units led by a chieftain, with neighbouring nests respecting each other's territories and living in harmony. This peaceful and accepting attitude went beyond just other sapsuckers and was extended to all neighbours of a nest, including the many other species who eventually arrived from off-world to colonise the lowlands of sapsucker. Due to the unfavourable conditions found in the lowlands, the native avians did not understand the off-worlder's choice to live there, but were not opposed to their presence. Despite their human-like hands allowing tools use, 
the sapsuckers only reached the point of using bone, stone and wood, being less technologically advanced even than the Dewanains also called Ewok, a species of the moon to their planet. Some nests, however, did begin to trade with their non-sapsuckers neighbours in the lowlands, paying particular attention to the starships the off-worlders used to fly, which the avians believed were shiny rocks. These trading sapsuckers had no interest in using the technology they gained, however, and used the various pieces they acquired to line the open-air nests and perches they dwelt in, which could be either natural or artificial. All sapsuckers naturally excelled at learning new languages, as they were able to perfectly mimic sounds they heard and did so when hearing new words as a way of learning them. This repetition was often misinterpreted by non-sapsuckers as mockery, which could lead to trouble when individuals encountered sapsuckers for the first time. The predatory Mulets creatures which inhabited the polar regions of sapsuckers held a position of extreme importance in sapsuckers' belief and folklore. The creature's name was the sapsuckers' word for a spirit of violent, senseless conflict that cannot be reasoned with, and the beasts were often used as characters in sapsuckers' legend, being personified as conflict incarnate, a force of evil that had to be respected, acknowledged and feared. Not seen as evil, the Mules appeared to be practically worshipped by the sapsuckers from an outsider's perspective, and killing them was strictly forbidden, despite the fact that the animals preyed upon sapsuckers along with anything else they encountered. The sapsuckers maintained that Mules mainly ate kill, a herbivorous species also native to sap, and as Mulets were rare and only dwelt in some of the low valleys, this was true for most of the year, but in the warmest season, the mules would sometimes venture higher up the mountains and cause the sapsuckers to flee their homes to avoid conflict with the spirit of sapsucker. The sapsuckers avoided the valleys where mules could be found at all costs, and even avoided speaking about the predators if possible, as though the beasts could hear them. The sapsucker's weapon of choice was the sling, and each sapsuckers would build their own personal weapon to use. This was because the avians were able to use the projectile weapons for hunting while in flight or on the ground. Sapsuckers would also hunt by diving from great heights and grabbing their prey in their talons. Some sapsuckers also carried staffs. In battle, some sapsuckers also used spears or axes instead of slings. Sapsuckers also made use of the mineral exonium, which they mined from the mountains they lived in. The stones were used by the avians to prepare food during winter, which the sapsuckers knew as the frost time. At some point in the sapsuckers' history, humans and other off-world species belonging to the Hakig religion arrived on Rishi and began building settlements and spaceports in the lowlands, the only areas suitable for them to live. The sapsuckers made contact with these aliens, and after initial misunderstandings about the sapsuckers' method of learning new languages, the two groups quickly came to peacefully coexist, with some sapsuckers' nests even starting to trade with the newcomers. Some attempts were made by the Hakig practitioners to convert the natives, but all met with failure and the return of the sapsuckers to their mountaintop homes. When questioned by off-worlders on the Mules, the natives were cryptic and unhelpful, with all non-sapsuckers' understanding of the predators being pieced together from a large number of minor references and idle speculation, as no non-sapsuckers had ever definitely encountered a Mules, although some possible run-ins were reported. When questioned as to the reason the Mulets had not reached the Hikig settlements, also located in the lowlands, the sapsuckers had few answered, only stating that the beasts had not found those areas yet. This led some non-sapsuckers to question the existence of Mules altogether. While those scientists who believed the natives theorized some form of pathogen may have prevented the Mulets entering the inhabited valleys. As the sapsuckers showed no opposition to the settlement of the lowlands, off-worlders assumed Mulets' territory was not sacred or that the sapsuckers believed the settlers should learn of the dangers the predators posed the hard way. The next bird race are called the Patagonians. The Patagonian are an avian species native to the planet Patagon. They had long necks, shoulders covered in green feathers, a small green tail and oddly shaped heads. 
The average lifespan for a Patagonian was about nine to 10 years, their time fame. Most Patagonians succumbed to senility at age nine. The Patagonian homeworld of Patagon featured cities laid out like enormous mazes. While off-worlders found the configuration off-putting, Patagonian had little trouble navigating the passageways due to their innate magnetic sense. Although their bodies were only somewhat humanoid, Patagonian made do with devices and furnishings, such as chairs, aimed at species with longer legs. While Patagonian operated comfortably without clothing, they sometimes dressed in items such as goggles, tabards, chaps, five bandoliers or shirts. Another Patagonian's fashion was to bind the hair of the cheeks into ponytails. Halians or Halians are a large avian sentient species native to the moon Halians, which orbited the gas giant Marl. Families of Halians lived in Clan Ares. They were first contacted by the feline beings, after which millions of Halians left their homeworld to seek their fortunes in the galaxy at large. The Halians traded with the feline beings, but their relations with the reptilians were characterized by wary hostility after the chose to join with the good feline beings. The bird beings are called the ancients as well because they are one of the oldest races. The bird beings helped the ancients govern the universe. The reptilian race came from the bird beings. They were drafted out of them by a scientist named Mother Huber, an ancient. The ancients, Rizkians, made a covenant with the bird beings and mixed their seed and became one. The bird beings were part of the Elohim and they played a part in the creating of man. The bird DNA is encoded in the human DNA. The reptilians came out of the birds and the humans have a lot of reptilian DNA in them. The avian beings are here vibrating in the fourth to the eighth dimensions to assist with the ascension project. Their motherships vibrate on third to the eighth dimension to pure light. Their ships are parked throughout the galaxy to stabilize the new energy coming in. This is because the Andromeda galaxy is joining on with the Milky Way. The Ascended Ones sometimes use spacecraft, as you understand them, but utilize advanced devices, such as the spheres, which have been dispatched to protect your planet and solar system. Also to trap disagreeable beings in or out. The bird beings don't abduct humans. The blue avians primarily communicate using telepathy and often initiate contact with humans via a dream. The blue avian also uses a form of sign language and have created a secret greeting that they teach contactees to verify a truthful blue avian connection. These beings possess telekinetic powers due to their existence outside of physical reality. They also use light physical touch as a form of communication to induce a positive physical and emotional response. The ancient mixed with the bird beings. The ancients and bird beings are one in the same they enter into a covenant. The ancients gained wings, some had four and some gained six. Some of them made advanced wings that detached. These ancient humanoid bird beings later mixed with the Naga and Hindu avatars. This created beings with bird DNA, the ancient and Najaru DNA. Notice the blue on the headdress as in blue avians on the ancient Egyptian bird gods. Like we say, many races mixed with each other. Billions of years before the Najaru came out of the water, the reptilian Meldekians from the planet Meldek mixed with the bird beings creating draconians. They were now flying serpents, reptilians with wings, and they became more powerful. The Milky Way galaxy is like a melting pot. When we say Najaru, we mean the ancient Egyptian gods. The blue avians are here watching Ashtar command as well. The blue avians are currently acting as a buffer between our ascension, negative ETs and human interests. They choose to practice physical non-interference with our species. Their level of intelligence has transcended physical limitations, duality, reality, and they act as a single intelligent entity. They have returned to right their past as a direct attempt to aid humanity, which at the previous times of contact were distorted by our species' interpretation of them arrival. The blue avians have once again returned to our planetary system to help with this ascension, urging us to free ourselves from the clutches of negative human and ET entities. Only a few people will make it. The Earth is referred to as the school of the birds. The birds are master teachers of ascension. The human even created a copy of these beings on the children's show Sesame Street called Big Bird. The elite knows about these beings and their mission. Big Bird is a blue avian, and they know. 
At their most evolved state, the ruling class of the carrions resemble humans with eagle-like features and coloring. Like the original felines, the carrions first arrived in this universe when it was being created. A group of 45 came at the request of the founders of this universe to help assist and oversee the universal game. The Rizkians gave the carrions a new planet in the Orion constellation for their home. It was more tropical in design and featured an abundance of humid swamps and jungles. It also had more islands than large land masses. Like the felines, they were etheric and therefore had to develop physical bodies from the life forms evolving on the planet's surface. They chose the life form that would become the bird and over a period of hundreds of thousands of years, they developed bodies of varying colors and sizes. The carrions were known for their unique affinity towards colored plumage and so created physical bodies that reflected their creative talent in this area. That is why the carrions have much more variety of size, shape and color in their race than do the felines. They can be 12 feet tall or only a few inches in height. Also like the felines, a group of the original 45 carrions remained etheric and became a council that oversaw and managed the development of their brothers and sisters who chose to incarnate on the planet as part of the upgrading of their physical forms. When their physical vehicles had reached a certain level of development, they began genetic crossing, something they had learned from the felines, with certain reptiles that had evolved in the swamps and warmer regions of the Tiamat planet. Like we said, the result of this genetic program was the creation of a new hybrid race known to us as the Draconians. They were part carrion and part reptile. In time, the Draconians became more abundant in the royal lines than the purebred carrions. Draconians and their first derivative, the flying serpents, snakes, then carrions. By the time of the first Earth Grand Experiment, the House of Draconians is headed by a winged serpent known as Kobazar. Kobazar is the father of Jobava, who is up next. It is said that Kobazar is Tarnish's grandson by his son, Halal, who is trapped in the fourth dimension. The Carrions are known for their sharp analytical abilities and organizational skills. A predominant character trait of the Carrions is their need to maintain a good appearance and image at all times. They are good team players as long as the team structure involves discipline and strictly adhered to codes of conduct. You will find a preponderance of carrions involved in the creation and maintenance of stargates, dimensional grids and magnetic fields throughout the galaxy and universe. Their inherent analytical abilities make them well suited for this kind of work. They are also known for their militaristic capabilities and their starships are more advanced than many in the universe. They held the majority of the military posts during the first Earth Grand Experiment. It was a carrion commander that ruled over the vast fleet of starships and cruisers for the Lyran Galactic Federation and the royal houses of Avion and Anu. There are about 12,000 different types of birds or avians type beings across the galaxy. Then there's another one million subspecies so, we have talked to you about the main races. We couldn't talk about them all. The tape would be hours long. Bird was also a slang name for a starship. Typically, birds could fly. However, there were some flightless species. Some people think that the bird race doesn't exist. Then they walk right outside and see hundreds of birds. Extraterrestrial beings are right in your face. There were no bird beings here when Tiamat, which is Earth, was covered with water and had no land. These bird beings came here from other galaxies. The bird beings are one of the races of angels. In Ezekiel 1, 5, 11, they are described as having the likeness of a man and having four faces, that of a man, the Anunnaki, Rizkians, Najaru and other humanoid races, one having a lion face, the feline beings, on the right side, and one having a face like an ox, center beings, on the left side, and an eagle, bird beings. In Revelation 19, 17, it read, and I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, letting you know the bird beings. One aspect of the birds fight with God or the Lord God. In the Bible, Revelation 4, 7 describes a living creature with a face like a man, 
and another that resembles an eagle in flight. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. All of these quotes make refer to angels having faces like birds. These beings are angelic hosts. Some chose to fight with Murdoch or Michael and his angels. Some chose to fight with the dragon and his angels. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7.7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Eight and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. Nine, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. In 1962, on a desolate stretch of French road, a businessman claimed to have encountered a gang of aggressive bird-like beings, which not only blocked his car, but allegedly attacked him. The first account of this utterly unique close encounter was published in 1968 in the volume of 14, number 6, Navran Decker issue of the Flying Saucer Review. The report came from a man who was at the time described as a young researcher from the southern part of France named Lionel Trigano. According to Trigano, the witness, who would be referred to only as Mr. S, was a solidly built man in his 50s who ran an important garage in Hero, France. Ancient Mesopotamia Ancient Artifacts. Sumerian bird visitor Trigano interviewed the perturbed eyewitness, who, under strict conditions of anonymity, confided his perplexing tale to the young ufologist. Here is the witness's own account of the event, which was translated by John C. Hugel and published in the FSR under the title Strange Encounter in Var. And like all good tales of terror, this one begins on a dark and stormy night. One evening in November 1962, I was driving along a minor departmental road in Var. It was a dark night and raining in torrents, so that I was driving with my lights full on. The trip had been thus far uneventful, but it would soon take a literal turn into the twilight zone, according to the observer. Rounding the bend, I saw 80 meters just over 260 feet ahead, a group of figures clustered in the middle of the road. I slowed down to avoid the group, and at the same moment it split into two parts, suddenly and jerkily. It was then that Mr. S noticed that there was something decidedly unnatural about the mob of jaywalkers blocking his passage. My window was down, and I leaned my head out slightly to see what the matter was. It was then that I saw beasts, some kind of bizarre animals, with the heads of birds and covered with some sort of plumage which were hurling themselves from two sides towards my car. This petrifying confrontation with unknown and decidedly violent creatures would be more than enough to disturb anyone, but just when things seemed to have reached maximum levels of high strangeness, they took a turn for the downright bizarre. Terrified, I wound up my window, accelerated like a madman, and the stopped 150 metres approximately 500 feet further on. I turned round and saw these things, these beasts, these nightmarish sorts of beings, which were heading with a sort of flapping of wings towards a luminous dark blue object, which hung in the air over a field on the other side of the road. Mr. S then described this ostensibly extraterrestrial vehicle in more detail. It resembled two plates upside down and placed on one another, as if a flock of attacking birdmen and a hovering UFO would not strain the sanity of even the hardiest individual. Mr. S put the proverbial cherry on the Sunday with his final observations. On reaching it, the UFO, these birds were literally sucked into the underpart of the machine as if by a whirlwind. Then I heard a dull sound, clack, and the object flew off at a prodigious speed and finally disappeared. It seems strange that these bipedal bird creatures were sucked into the flying saucer rather than climbing back inside, as happens in most occupant reports. As bizarre as this may sound, one almost can't help but wonder whether these beasts were actually piloting the UFO seen by Mr. S, or if they represent some kind of alien pets, or even a food source, kind of the equivalent of intergalactic free-range chickens. After all, extraterrestrials have got to eat too. According to Trigano, Mr. S had no interest in the UFO phenomenon or in making his story public. 
simply for fear of being thought mad. Even if the witness had no interest in pursuing the origins of these creatures, the rest of us are left with the conundrum of just what the heck did this middle-aged garage manager see on that rain-drenched eve back in 1962? The editor who commented on the FSR story sagely, especially considering this was back in 1968, when it was a daunting task to correlate such disparate accounts, felt that this story was important, especially in light of the Mothman report filed by John Keel in the magazine's July-August 1968 edition. That concludes the video. Please like, share and subscribe and comment. Thanks for tuning in, family. Peace.